Hello and welcome to the History of Modern Greece. I'm your host, Daniel Roberts, and I'm here with my father, George, and our theme music is brought to you by Mark Youngerman. This is a podcast that covers the events from the fall of ancient Greece to the modern day. This is episode 10, The Assyrians and Zoroastrianism. So for today's episode, we're going to talk about who the Persians are. And in order to tell this story, we have to go back a little bit more and get into the origin story of the Persians. And that story takes place right in the middle of the Bronze Age with uh, a civilization known as the Assyrians. And uh, the story of the Assyrian Empire starts with a little city on the Tigris River called Asher. And it's in this city where a king is going to turn his little city-state into one of the biggest empires the world has ever known. So the, the city of Asher, being located on the Tigris, started off as a trading city. And like any other city in the region at the time, they were trading with tin and textiles. They were part of the network that was the Bronze Age. And they were kind of surrounded by many different empires at the time. Some of them were the Hittites, the Egyptians were a prominent empire, and I think the Sumerians? Yeah, the Sumerian Empire was big around the time of Asher. And they were always conquering each other, and it wasn't wasn't really a safe time to live, even though there was prosperity. And eventually, uh, either a priest or a king, or a priest who took the title of king, and also the name of the city, which was also the name of the city's god, which kind of like every other city back then, they had a patron god for their their city. Anyways, this man, he started a new tradition of conquest. He wasn't going to be conquered by his neighbors anymore. He was going to take the conquering to them. And he ended up creating a conscripted army. And he just went on a rampage and conquered all the little cities around him and absorbed them into his empire. And this is the birth of the Assyrian Empire. And it all started from Asher, a small city on the Tigris River. So around the year 1300 BCE, the Assyrian Empire was growing and becoming a significant power state in the region. And this is around the same time as the Hittite Empire growing into one of the more dominant forces in the Middle East, and same with the Egyptian Empire around its height. But this is also the same time period as the collapse of the Bronze Age. And we know about the volcano that erupted in Thera and the Sea Peoples, and the Assyrians are not going to be spared the same destruction that came to the rest of the world. In around the year 1200 BCE came the collapse of the Bronze Age and the onset of the Sea People. Now the Sea People, they destroyed the Hittite Empire. They were wiped out. In fact, almost every city in the region was burned to the ground. And there was no exception here either. And the only two real power states survived the collapse of the Bronze Age. One of them was the Egyptian Empire, although they were fatally wounded by this collapse. They broke up into several city-states at this point. And the Assyrian Empire went from this vast empire full of many cities and little provinces down almost back to their original territory, just a dwindled little state. But they did survive the collapse of the Bronze Age, unlike most of their neighbors. In 911 BC, a new king founded the Neo-Assyrian Empire, rekindling the flames of the early days of the Assyrian Empire. The new kings were merciless conquerors and brilliant engineers when it came to building siege equipment. And once they conquered a people, they ruled over them with a very harsh iron fist, often punishing people by impaling them in the city squares. And sometimes they would peel the skins off their living victims and line the pillars of city buildings with the flesh of its dissidents. These acts were meant to strike the most crippling fear among the populace, preventing anyone from even dreaming about disobeying their overlords. The Neo-Assyrians grew their empire very fast and were soon ruling over many different ethnic and religious groups of people. Their secret to dealing with these people was to completely uproot civilizations and deporting them to faraway parts of the empire. Whenever a part of the empire was in need of a local labor force, the Assyrians would shuffle entire communities throughout the land, fulfilling their obligations wherever needed be. This extremely cruel way of separating people from their ancestral homeland worked really well for the government that was constantly trying to keep the empire operating at optimal strength. 
This system led to the Neo-Assyrians becoming the largest empire in the region for several hundred years. For a short five-year reign, Samu Ramat, queen of Neo-Assyria, ruled the entire empire on her own. She was even a well-liked queen, who her contemporaries had a lot of respect for, unlike a certain queen we will cover at the end of the season. While the kings and queen who ruled over the empire dedicated their lives to military campaigns and bringing glory upon their reign, the Neo-Assyrian leaders were also known for investing in literature and science and art, spending lots of resources on gardens with zoos and libraries with ancient literature. Throughout the centuries, tribes had been slowly migrating from the Eurasian steppe through the mountains and into southern Iran. These nomadic tribes were the Medes and the Persians who settled in the far north and far south of modern-day Iran. In 628 BCE, a man named Zoroaster was born, and his life would have repercussions on the entire world. Zoroaster was a prophet who taught a very new message for the time. He preached monotheism to the world in an age where many gods were worshipped in a single city. Now this was significant, because up until now, in our narrative, following the Indo-Europeans to the Greeks, there were many gods, always a sky father, and also a set of twins with some kind of attachment to horses, but this was different. Yet the culture that gave us monotheism was Persian. And Persians are also a branch of the Proto-Indo-Europeans. This was a brand new religion. A brand new concept. One God. And not just the God of all gods, but the one and only God. And this God's name was Ahura Mazda. Zoroaster was a teacher, and his teachings were written down in hymns, which have been labeled the Gothas. These Gothas were later amalgamated into the Avesta, which we own, by the way. A good comparison would be the Gospels, and how once combined, they become the Holy Bible. It was the exact same thing. Ahura Mazda was, and is, the supreme being who controls the Asha. Asha is a force that flows through the universe. Asha is all that is light. Asha is all that is good. And Asha is all that is virtuous. But with lightness, there must be darkness. And the dark force in the universe is known as the drudge. And the spirit that lives within it is known as the Ahraman or Angiramanyu. This is the devil. If you want to Google Ahraman, you'll find an image of a chimera. A lion with the horns of a bull, the tail of a snake, a back full of feathers, and hands and feet of a raptor. Asha is the light and goodness of the universe, and is represented by fire, for fire is of God. Drudge is the exact opposite, and is represented by darkness. This leads to the notion that Zoroastrianism is a dualist religion, where there is an eternal struggle between good versus evil, light versus dark, truth versus lies, angels versus demons, heaven versus hell, and God versus the devil. There are six virtuous attributes in the Zoroastrian religion. Number one is good purpose. Number two is right-mindedness. Number three is righteous power. Number four 
devotion. Number five, integrity. And number six, immortality. Once a soul died, it was judged by godly beings. And its deeds and thoughts were weighed to see whether or not the soul would make it into heaven. Or if it should be cast into the drudge to waste away in darkness. Only the just and virtuous were brought into the light. The rest were cast away to fade into the darkness and be consumed by the drudge. Zoroastrians did not congregate in halls or churches or synagogues or mosques. At least they were not expected to. But there were fire temples erected that housed giant altars with large fires that burned continuously throughout the day and the night. This internal flame was meant to represent the Asha, the force of good that will forever burn in the universe so long as there is light. It may be logical for you or I to think, hey, these people worship the fire. They must cremate their dead. Well, that would be false. First off, the Zoroastrians did not worship fire, but also the belief was that a soul was made of Asha, and it filled the body. Once a human died, that soul, or Asha, was taken away, and the empty shell of a corpse was filled with drudge. A corpse was therefore considered to be contaminated with the drudge. It was filled with evil. The body was neither buried nor cremated, for cremating a body would be to wash the drudge with Asha, and that was sacrilege. Instead, the bodies were carried out into the desert and left for the birds to pick clean. This tradition definitely helped with the circle of life and the animal food chain. These birds would eat the flesh and turn the dead body into life for their baby chicks, turning the drudge into Asha. There are two holidays celebrated by the Zoroastrians, Nauruz and Yalda. For a society that worshipped light and good and fire, it's very understandable that their two greatest holidays would be the winter solstice and the spring equinox. Now these holidays are remarkably close to the Christian holidays, Christmas and Easter. Nauruz is celebrated on the winter solstice. Because it is the moment the days stop growing darker and the days slowly grow brighter, showing a triumph of the Asha. Yalda is celebrated because it represents the moment the days are longer than the nights. Now if it is because of the Asha that Zoroastrians celebrate Yalda or Easter and Nauruz or Christmas, is because they are celebrating the growing light in the days. So that makes you wonder. Does that mean they were scared of the summer solstice and fall equinox, where the days started to grow shorter and the night grew larger than the day? I ask this because I looked this up and I could not find the answer. Yazd is the capital, or holiest of cities. And many Zoroastrians went on pilgrimage to the holy site in the mountains to visit the eternal flame. This religion was decentralized, so there was no pope or patriarch or caliph. Instead, there were three levels of priests. The first degree priests could only perform small rituals outside of the temples. The second degree of priest was able to perform fire rituals inside of the temple. And the third degree master priest or dust tour were wise men who had read all of the scriptures and they could perform any ritual and they managed the fire temples themselves. They were great spiritual leaders. Zoroaster spent his early years in training to be a priest. 
His family had all the resources they needed to put him in school, but he did not want to stay inside and listen to old men speak. He wanted to go out and experience the world for himself. He wandered the wilderness of Bactria, which is modern-day Afghanistan, searching for the true meaning of life. And this is when Ahura Mazda, the divine god, came to Zoroaster and bestowed upon him this great knowledge. And as the religion of Zoroaster spread, and the great empires started to adopt it as their own, the six righteous truths were melded with physical abilities. Good purpose with cattle, right-mindedness with fire, righteous power with iron, devotion with earth and soil, integrity with water, and immortality with nature. This physical representation of the six righteous truths helped bring the pagan societies into understanding with the monotheistic religion. For these pagans usually had an individual god for each of these truths. Zoroastrianism had a profound effect on the people living within the Persian Empire and without. If you look at the Old Testament book of the Bible, Isaiah, the first half speaks about the Assyrian conquests of the Middle East. It speaks about the Assyrian king laying down and conquering the neighbors of Israel and how the Neo-Babylonians finally conquered Judea. Now the first half of this Old Testament book was most likely written by Isaiah himself. But the second half of the book speaks about Cyrus the Great and the Jews being freed from captivity. These events were over 150 years later and were definitely written by someone familiar with Zoroastrianism. The book of Esther from the Old Testament is another great example of Zoroastrianism's influence on the Hebrew culture. The book of Esther explains how the Jews survived captivity. The author of this book clearly lived within the Persian Empire as they had a lot of information on the Persian city of Susa, and yet they had almost no understanding of what was happening in Israel. In the book of Esther, the villain is named Haman, which is remarkably similar to the evil spirit of the drudge, Ahriman. The Avesta also speaks of the glorious Aryan people. Now, the Aryans are not the people Hitler was talking about during World War II, as the Aryans here refer to the original Proto-Indo-Europeans. After all, Ahura Mazda is the god of the Aryan people, and therefore the god over the entire Indo-European tribe. And the Zoroastrians quickly attributed the people in the Avesta, the Aryans, as the Persian people themselves, and they slowly stopped referring to themselves as Persians and started calling themselves Aryan or Iranian. You see, Iran, or Iranian, literally translates into land of the Aryans. I guess you could call it land of the Proto-Indo-Europeans. Mm. Actually, no, you probably shouldn't do that. The Zoroastrians also have a cataclysmic story in their Bible. But this story is different from the flood in the Hebrew Bible, or the Sumerian flood of Gilgamesh, or the great flood caused by Zeus. This cataclysmic event was one of ice and drought. You see, the story starts during the so-called Golden Age of Jamshid, the divinely guided ancient leader of early Indo-Iranians, long before the prophet Zoroaster was born. Here it is necessary to understand the basics of Zoroastrian religious cosmology. You see, the good behavior of humans is believed to strengthen the good angelic forces, or the Asha, and to bring blessings, life increase, and welfare to all creations. 
The bad behavior was believed to strengthen the harmful forces, or the drudge, and to bring catastrophes, death, and suffering. Humans are seen as the central, direct, and indirect causes of almost all what happens, as per Zoroaster, of course. The Golden Age of Jamshid refers to the time when Jamshid and his people were close to moral perfection, and hence the demonic powers and destruction were separated from them, as long as they were sticking to the righteous path. And they lived for hundreds of years. During the centuries of their great, blessed life, their numbers increased greatly, and according to the Avesta, God even enabled Jamshid several times over to let the earth be widened to create more space for the increasing number of people. It almost sounds like the Golden Age in the Greek mythology, or the Garden of Eden in the Old Testament. However, the last time when the population filled the earth, Ahura Mazda instructed Jamshid to act differently. He revealed to him that one day, in a very distant future, terrible cataclysmic winters would fall upon the earth with an extreme freeze and much snow, and that the majority of earthly people, animals, and vegetation will perish. After the end of the winters, the melting snow will of course cause a massive flood. But these melting snow floods were only the closing event and consequences of the long winter. Jamshid was hence instructed to build a great underground enclosure called a vara, which secluded them from the open outer world and to bring the most people, animals, and seeds from the current earthly surplus whose vital descendants would help to repopulate the world after the catastrophe. He was instructed by Ahura Mazda how to construct a water canal, how to construct lights which would substitute the sun. Jemshi did as he was told, prepared the vara, brought the selected ones there, and sealed its entrance. However, he himself did not join them, and he remained on the surface with the rest of mankind, the era of Jamshid ended with his moral failure and the consequent conquest of Iran by the sorcerer Zohak. Now according to this scripture, the world hasn't ended yet, and we are still waiting for God's wrath to bring about the apocalypse, or the long winter. Now this long winter sounds to me an awful lot like an ice age. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time on the History of Modern Greece. Stay safe and stay awesome.